Today in our progressive series, we've tackled many, many subjects. Today I'm going to endeavor to talk to you about the environment, environmentalism. I'm discovering that environmentalism has become, in many ways, anti-human, anti-freedom, anti-economic development, and in many ways, anti-reason. Why is that? I believe so that it's the, so the civil government can control us more by bureaucrats who many times make money from it. I'm not saying all of our civil government bureaucrats, politicians, are corrupt, but I know that many of them are. There's a difference between the biblical view of the environment and a political movement known as environmentalism. A political movement is a collective attempt by a certain group of people to change civil government policy or public values. For sure, many of the biblical public values that we have, in, have endured for many years in America, that there are many public values that are changing by many. Understanding the difference will help us as Christians to see environmentalism appropriately. I start with Genesis 1, starting at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have you shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God gave Adam the ability to subdue. The word subdue is very important. That God has given give, give Adam authority over everything. As I learned it in the King James Version when I was a boy, over every creeping thing that creepeth. How many know the devil's a creep? And Adam had dominion and authority over the devil and all the animals and everything else that God created. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening. And there was morning, the sixth day. Number one in your outline, the Bible is clear that the earth and everything in it was given by God to man to rule over, by God to man to rule over and subdue. Meaning that if something is not right, Adam, Adam, you have the ability and the authority that I've given you, Adam. If something's not right, change it. Because mankind was created in God's image, he gave men and women a place of privilege and responsibility among all creatures, or meaning creation, and commanded them to exercise stewardship over the earth. Psalms 8, 6 is very clear about this. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. That's pretty clear. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. To tend implies caretaking and not abusing. Have, 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 have people abused the earth, the oxygen, the water? Are, are there things going on in our world that is abusive to our environment? Yes. Sin has brought on all kinds of decay and death and destruction. That is for sure. God wanted us to be caretakers of all that he made. To care and preserve and protect it. This is seen in the Old Testament, by the way, where the land was to be left fallow every seventh year in order to replenish the soil nutrients. Let the land rest 
and to ensure continued provision for his people in the future. We read in Exodus 23, 10 and 11, plant and harvest your crops for six years, but let the land be renewed and lie uncultivated during the seventh year. In addition to our role as caretakers, we're to appreciate the ability and the beauty of the environment, the earth, the wildlife, the ecosystem, etc. Point number two, in God's incredible grace and power. He's placed on this planet everything needed to feed, clothe, and house the billions of people who have lived on it since the Garden of Eden. His resources for our needs are renewable. Isn't it amazing? Including his provision of the sun and the rain and all that's necessary. Do you know that my whole life, I'll be 65 on my next birthday, and every day of my life, the sun has come up every morning. God's provided everything necessary to sustain and replenish on this earth. It's amazing when you think that that people tell us that somewhere since Adam and Eve to now that over 100 to 118 billion people have lived or are living on this planet. That's an astounding number. He's also decorated the planet in glorious color and scenic beauty to appeal to our aesthetic senses. But it's important to know that the earth we inhabit, hey, just in case somebody doesn't know this, the earth that we inhabit is not a permanent planet. Point number three. The environment movement is consumed with trying to preserve the planet forever. And we know We, meaning Christian people who study God's word, know this is not God's plan. 2 Peter 3, starting at verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be be destroyed like this, what Holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, the Lord's patient gives people time to be saved. Also, Revelation 21, 1 and 2, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So, Rather than trying to preserve the earth, we're to be good stewards of it for as long as it lasts. Which, by the way, how long will the earth last? As long as it needs to, to serve God's sovereign purpose. That's how long it'll last. And then it will pass away. And we're going to have a new earth. Praise God. And I'm going to have a new body. And there's going to be no more sin or death or weeds or thorns. It's going to be like it was before sin entered. And when sin entered this world through Adam and Eve, death and decay came. But there's coming a time when there will be no more death, no more decay, No more aging, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more grief, no more tears. God's going to take the biggest handkerchief ever known to mankind. And the Bible says he's going to wipe away all tears. Think about it. Number four. How should Christians view climate change? 
We should be concerned about our effect on our environment. God appointed man to be the steward of this world, Genesis 128, and not the destroyer of it. In your next part of your outline, the next thing says, but we should not allow anyone, that's your fill in the blank, anyone, we should not allow anyone to make us think that the rights of an inanimate object or non-human creatures are held in equal or higher regard than mankind created in God's image. I'll talk more about that in a moment. We got we to understand that because that's being falsely thought about. Reminds me of this... Um, Reminds me of this little boy went to dad and he said, Dad, how were people made? And he said, well, son, way back a long time ago in the Garden of Eden, God created man and woman. And they had children. And they had children. And fast forward, here we are today, and that's how boys and girls, men and women, were made. They were created by God. Same little boy goes to mom and he asks mom the same question. And mom says, son, a long, long time ago, eons ago, there were monkeys. <laughs> and monkeys over time evolved and evolved and evolved until they became man. And men and women, that's where we came from, from monkeys. Little boy goes back to dad, so confused. He said, Dad, Dad, I, Mom told me something totally different. And he explained what Mom said. And he said, Dad, you told me that we were created by God. I, I don't understand. Can you explain? And Dad says, oh, sure, son. He said, when I gave you the answer, I was talking about my side of the family. <laughs> Romans 1, 22 through 26, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, folks, check this out. This verse is very, helps us very much to understand a little bit of what craziness is going on in the thinking of the worldly system that we live in in the flesh. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. Folks, what we see happen, happening today in the world and in America and even in the so-called church, why we have sexual sin gender confusion and abortion. Those are some of the reasons why God abandoned people to their fleshly, sinful desires. Some of you, like me, have wondered how in the world can people become so deceived, so crazed, so no common sense whatsoever about things that have been solved by God way before us. God has allowed them to be abandoned to their own selfish, natural desires. And we need to pray that the word of God would come alive, their conscience would come back. They would begin to live for truth instead of the lies from hell, the demonic forces that are doing so much governing today. 
Remember, people are not our enemy. The devil is our enemy and his demonic forces from hell that use people. With any talk of the environment, it's vital to understand what the facts are, where those facts come from, and how they're interpreted, and to know the spiritual implications. A careful look at this subject, and it becomes apparent that there's a great deal of disagreement about its facts and its substance. Those who blame man for climate change frequently disagree about what facts led them to that conclusion. Experience and research leads us to believe that warming is, in fact, occurring. However, there's not much objective evidence that man is the cause, nor that the effects will be catastrophic. Hey, question. Don't give me the answer. Just let me say the question. We'll move on. Why would Obama purchase an $11.75 million home on the coastline at Martha's Vineyard if he believes climate change is causing the water to rise beyond the beach. <laughs> Turns out the notion of rising seas swallowing up island nations is actually more climate alarmism designed to erode opposition to a massive government takeover of the American economy. Studies reveal that many of the endangered reef islands in the Pacific and Indian Oceans have actually increased in land mass in recent years. National Geographic reported in 2015, and I quote, that many islands, especially less developed ones with few permanent structures, may cope with rising seas well into the next century, including Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> Point number five, the idea of Earth wearing out is appropriate. This entire world has been continually decaying since the fall. Climate change facts are extremely hard to come by. One of the few facts universally agreed upon is that the current average temperature of Earth is rising at this time period. In the time period that we're living in right now, the Earth is warming up. According to most estimates, this increase amounts to, here's what it, to most estimates, this is what it amounts to. Three quarters to one and three quarters degree Fahrenheit over the last 100 years. Data regarding times before that is not only highly speculative, but very difficult to obtain with any accuracy. The facts leading people to believe that humans are not responsible for the current change in temperature are as follows. Okay, a little bit academic for two minutes, but you can handle it. Here I go. It's not in your notes. Number one, global temperature changes from past millennia, according to available data, were often severe and rapid long before man supposedly had any impact at all. So the current climate change is not as unusual as some alarmist would like you to believe. Point number two. Well, I don't like, Pastor, how you're presenting this. That's all right. Go pastor your own church. I'm sorry. That was not in my notes. I love you all. Anyway, point number two. Recent recorded history mentions times of noticeable global warming and cooling long before man had any ability to produce industrial emissions. Point number three. Water vapor, not carbon monoxide, is the most influential greenhouse gas. It's difficult to determine what effect, if any, mankind has on worldwide vapor, water vapor levels. Four, given the small percentage of human-produced carbon dioxide as compared to other greenhouse gases, human impact on global temperature may be as little as 1%. Five, 
Global temperatures are known to be influenced by other non-human controlled factors such as sunspot activity, orbital movement, volcanic activity, solar system effects, and so forth. Carbon dioxide emission is not the only plausible explanation for global warming. Six, I'm almost done. Most of the global temperature increases of the last 100 years occurred before most of the man-made carbon dioxide was produced. And seven, in the 1970s, global temperatures had actually been dropping since 1945. I was alive in the 70s. I remember this. I was a teenager. It was, the, the winters were freezing. And they had been dropping since 1945. And there was a glo global cooling concern that became prominent in the 70s, despite what is now dismissed as a lack of scientific support. <laughs> now, while no one can deny that warming is occurring, it's difficult to support the idea that global warming is significantly influenced by human actions. There are fragments of evidence to support both sides and logical reasons to choose one interpretation over the other. Point number six, the question of human activity and climate change should not divide Christian believers from each other. This is a big point for me in my study and preparation for this message. Folks, we should not become divided over such a thing as environmentalism or the environment. Look at this scripture. Jesus spoke in Luke eleven seventeen. 17. He knew their thoughts, so he said, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Listen, we can disagree. You can love me and disagree with me. I can disagree with you and be kind and loving to you, and we can disagree and not necessarily have to be divisive. In fact, if we can disagree at times in godly ways and have good godly conversations because we're both bringing ourselves to God's word, it's not you trying to get me to think like you or me trying to get you to think like me, but we're trying to be more like him, then our disagreements can actually help us get closer to God sometimes. But divisiveness, there's no room for it in the house of God. It brings us down. Churches have been destroyed over divisive spirits that have been allowed to pop their ugly heads up. Thank you very much. And I'm not talking about good looks or bad looks. And not be dealt with within leadership because leadership is afraid to deal with it because it might be Mr. or Mrs. Big Bucks. What's happening in the American civil government right now? I don't know if you've realized this or not, but between the parties and the people that are in government right now, there is a civil war going on in the civil government. These people can't even have a conversation. Many of them. We need to pray for those who can, those who are willing to come to the table and talk and try to work things out and bring godly values. There are a few, praise God, and it's uphill for them all the way. We need to pray for them, because it's tough. There, long since the days when I was a boy, when President Reagan was the president and Tip O'Neill was there, and they could disagree with each other on the job all day long and then go have dinner together that night and cut up and have fun. We don't see much of that anymore, do we? I pray Christians don't fight about such things. Number seven, environmental issues are important, but they're not anywhere near as important as the eternal issues facing mankind. Christians ought to treat our world with respect and be good stewards, but we should not allow politically driven scare tactics to dominate our view of the environment. On January 11, 1970, the Washington Post reported that colder winters held dawn of a new ice age. In my lifetime, 
I was 10 years old, and they were nervous that an ice age is coming. Essentially, the climate change message is this. Greenhouse gas emissions are damaging the environment, and while we are not certain what the effect will be, we know it'll be bad. That's the message. Climatologists, ecologists, and geologists are unanimous in recognizing that the Earth has gone through significant, significant climate changes in the past. Duh. Some of the strongest proponents of climate change legislation are those, who are those who stand the greatest financial gain from green laws and technologies. Once again, folks, I don't know if you understand it, we're being played. Brake pads that have gone green cost you three times more than brake pads that are not green. Oh, I'm in the weeds, I'm sorry. I am trying to stay on task here, but I, you can't imagine the things rushing through my brain. God help me. Led by your spirit. Before the climate change mindset is accepted, it should be recognized that not everyone who promotes climate change is doing so from an informed foundation and pure motives. Follow the money and you will see that once again, we're being lied to because it's about greed and money and control and power. I heard a few, I heard a guy, I heard a guy just a few years ago say, he said this on the news, he said, you know, and this was January, he said six months ago in the summertime, it was warm. And six months from now, we are predicting, this is what he said, on the news, national news. We're predicting that six months from now, it will be an average of one degree warmer than it was six months ago from now. Hey, as long as I've been alive, it's been warm in the summer. <laughs> it's going to be one degree warmer on the average six months from now as it was six months ago. I have one question. Why is that on the news? Why is that even on the news? Christians should look at climate change biblically. What does the Bible say about climate change? Here's the truth. Not much. The Bible doesn't say much about it. Number eight, like, likely the closest biblical examples of what could be considered climate change would be the end time disasters prophesied in Revelation 6 through 18. Letter A. These prophecies have nothing to do with greenhouse gas emissions. Rather, they're the result of the wrath of God pouring out injustice on an increasingly wicked world. Also, a Christian must remember that God is in control and this world is not our home. God will one day erase and replace with new heavens and new earth. B, how much effort should be made saving a planet that God is eventually going to obliterate and replace with a planet so amazing and wonderful that the current earth pales in comparison? Just a thought. Now, is there anything wrong with going green? No! Is trying to reduce our carbon footprint a good thing? Maybe. But is this to be the primary focus of followers of Jesus Christ? No way! C, as Christians, our focus should be proclaiming the truth of the gospel, the message that has the power to save souls. So, climate change may or may not be real and may or may not be human caused. What we can know for certain is that God is good and sovereign and that planet Earth will be our temporary home for as long as God desires it to be. And while we're here, pick up the trash. Psalms 46, 2 through 3, so we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Number nine, sin makes it difficult for humans to exercise godly stewardship, but the work of Christ in, on, and through his people makes it possible. So, when God created the world, he set aside a unique place, the Garden of Eden, and placed in it the first man, Adam. God instructed Adam to cultivate and guard the garden, Genesis 2.15, to enhance its fruitfulness 
and to protect it. Having also created the first woman and having joined her to Adam, Genesis 2, 18 through 25, God commanded them and their descendants to multiply, to spread out beyond the boundaries of the Garden of Eden, to fill, subdue, and rule the whole earth and everything in it, Genesis 1, 26 and verse 28, by giving them his image and placing them in his authority. We, we as men and women that God created are created in the image of God, not the plants, not the animals, not anything else. Only you and me were created in the image of God. And sin has tainted that, that image, but we're still in the image of God. Nothing else. This puts human needs above non-human needs when the two are in conflict. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Straight up. I'm much more important to God than the grass. I'm going to live forever. We're going to have new grass that won't. I get a new body, it won't. I have a soul, it don't. Done stake, staking my case. Ten, number ten, to reject human stewardship is to embrace no stewardship. Freedom, the expression of the image of God, may be abused by sin and therefore needs restrictions, 1 Peter 2.16. We should note that governmental power necessary to subdue sin and reduce its harm must be exercised by sinful humans who may also abuse it. That's what we're seeing. The civil government isn't anointing by God as long as they stay in their lane and do what God told them to do. We need civil government if they do what God said. But it is... It is ran by sinful men and women who sometimes, many times, abuse their authority. Letter A, good and godly principles are reflected in the Constitution of the United States. Crucial to the Christian understanding of civil government is the fact that God has ordained it to do justice by punishing those who do wrong and praising those who do right. Romans 13, 1 through 4 1 Peter 2, 13 through 14. I want to stand up here and tell you I am so thankful for men and women who protect our streets every day for the police force. Are there, are there bad police officers? Yes. Are there pastors who don't preach the truth? Yes. Are there politicians who are crazy? Yes. Are some of you half nuts? I don't know. But I'm thankful for the police. And I'm thankful that I can go to bed at night with a locked door and sleep and not worry all night that somebody's going to break in and kill me. And we do have people that are concerned about it because of things that are happening in other cities and other places. Letter A, good and godly principles are reflected in the Constitution of the United States. Crucial to the Christian understanding of civil government is the fact that God has ordained it to do justice by punishing those who do wrong, praising those who do right. B, these principles indicate that a biblically sound environment stewardship is fully compatible with private property rights and a free economy as long as people are held accountable for their actions. If some of the powers that be get their way in America, I believe there will come a time, if the Lord tarries in my lifetime, if powers that be have their way, where they will take away Americans' rights to own property. Letter C. Stewardship can best be accomplished by a carefully limited government and through a commitment to virtuous human action in the marketplace and in civil government. These principles, when applied, promote both economic growth and environmental quality. I close with this, and then we're going to pray, and I want to sit down and talk to you for a few moments before you go and answer a question. 20% of the world's countries with the greatest economic freedom produce, on average, over 10 times as much wealth per capita as the 20% with the least economic freedom. I can bring 
I pray this will bring some perspective for you as a Christian today. I want to close right now and have the guys come and remove this pulpit. Let, would you stand to your feet? We're going to pray while they transition. Listen, any of you that want or have to or need to go or don't want to hear what I'm about to spend the next few moments on, you are welcome to leave, and I bless you in the name of the Lord. Let's close our eyes and pray while they're leaving if they need to. God, thank you for your love and your grace. Help us as God's people, Lord to believe the truth and not a lie and to operate in peace and strive to be more holy as you are holy and to live for God and others way more than we ever live for ourselves. Help us, Lord, to walk in humility and to know that you are a just and holy God. In Jesus' name, amen.